I mean, the only reason I went into became a journalist was because, uh, for reasons that are slightly too complicated to go into, I had no educational qualifications at all, and it was one of the very few professions, with the possible exception of burglary, that you could get into without any uh, educational qualifications. And I did love it actually, and I found that the training that I got as a journalist actually stood me in very good stead when I came to write books. Um, in what I mean, respect, I sorry, yes. In what, in what respect particularly? That you were good no. at picking people up and asking them embarrassing questions? Actually, I was always very bad at that. Uh -huh. But I do remember when I worked on the Evening Standard, you used to write something in the morning and then have the weird experience of going home in the evening. And there were so many editions of the Evening Standard at the time that you would see people as you were strap hanging on the tube, reading a piece that you'd written a few hours earlier. Wow. And I would always kind of try and work out when they were going to try and when they were going to turn the page and see if I could learn any lessons about how to hold people's attention. Um, and I'm not sure I did. But I think that, you know, journalism on the whole, it teaches one to be vivid and succinct. And although you meet uh, a lot of, you know, amazingly rackety people in journalism, uh, you tend not to meet very many uh, verbose or pretentious people. And I think that's, those are very, you know, useful qualities to learn in life as well. The absence of verbosity and pomposity. Yeah, but, um, no, I agree. I think journal uh, journalists are great. I've got nothing. Yeah, to exactly. No, it was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> um, so the move from journalism to books, you started off as a novelist. Right? Yes. About the world of the media. I started off as a novelist, but even then I thought, I remember my, the first novel I wrote, uh, I thought was rather funny, albeit in quite a dark way. And I think the sort of two or three people who read it complained that it made them feel suicidal for weeks afterwards. So I did begin to think, oh, maybe this is necessarily my natural calling. And, and then I kind of eventually got to write The Dig, uh, which, but only because my aunt had found the first gold discovered in Sutton Hoo in the 1939. And that, of course, was based on a true story. And from there, it didn't seem like such a big leap to, um, I mean, having essentially novelized something that had happened, um, I went to, I went to kind of using slightly, you know, novelish tricks uh, to write nonfiction. Which you did also with a, a very English scandal, I think. Yes. That sort of a novel, it's, I think it's described somewhere as a, no, a non-fiction novel. Yeah, I was always a bit baffled by what non-fiction novels were because oh. I mean, you know, essentially novels are made up. Um, but I did try to give A Very English Scandal, the kind of dramatic arc of a novel and to make it as vividly characterised as possible and also to, to pace it like a novel. It's a historical novel. Why not just call it a historical novel? Except because it is good. Well, because it actually history, because it's only three years ago. It's still history. Yes, but I did actually stick to what had happened, and I didn't allow myself any dramatic leeway, which I had done in the dig. Not that much, actually, but I certainly had. But with with very English scandal, it seemed extremely important that I should, you know, root the thing firmly in fact. Um, although I did, I did, as it were, streamline the story some to some degree for dramatic effect, which I also did with Maxwell, actually. Yes, quite. This is quite a lot, uh, quite a lot has been left uh, of detail. I yeah, mean, has been left yeah, out. exactly. I mean, I was kind of, you know, I know this is, this is going to sound an absurdly naive thing to say, but When I was when the when when the Maxwell book came out, I was genuinely quite surprised when I opened the reviews and see it described as a biography because I it never really properly occurred to me it was a biography uh, because 
it seems to me that a biography has some claims on being comprehensive. And yet, with Maxwell and indeed with, with Thorpe, um, I was wildly selective about what I used and what I didn't use. And there's a lot about Maxwell's life that I didn't use simply because it just didn't interest me that much. Mm. And I mean, there's all kinds of stuff about the British Printing Corporation and about him owning football clubs. And my feeling was step on the gas and drive the story forward. Um, uh, now, whether that's the right or the wrong thing, I don't know. But again, it does come back to, I suppose, trying to pace it like a novel. Oh, wonderful. So what was the actual germ? I mean, there have been quite a few books about oh, Maxwell. Maxwell already, Tom Bauer, Russell Davis, Roy. Yeah, exactly. What did you feel you had to add? <laughs> when um, it started, very English scandal had been televised. I don't think it actually come out by this stage. And I had lunch with the producer and they were casting around for other sort of vaguely scandalous stories to do. <clears throat> and I think he mentioned Maxwell and I roundly poo pooed the idea and said, no, no, I think that's a terrible idea. And then went home and thought about it. And I thought, oh God, actually, I think it's a really good idea. And it felt somehow that it was the right time to look at him afresh. I mean, it's 30 years exactly since he died. And he's still seen in this country anyway, as very much as, as the embodiment of corporate villainy. And it's as if so much black paint has been tipped over his head uh, that he's been turned into a bit of a kind of pantomime baddie. And I felt, even without knowing that much about him, that he was a more nuanced and complex figure than that. And that perhaps um, it was a good time in this. I mean, I'm, I'm, the timing is absolutely critical. I think it's Alan Bennett who said there's no period more boring than the recent past. And I think that's true. Mm. But then you go back a bit further and it sort of tilts over an indefinable point and it becomes history. And then it does become interesting, particularly if there's a marked contrast between the way we do things now and the way they did things then. And that I think was 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 very true in the case of a very English scandal. And, and the, the big change then, of course, was attitudes to homosexuality. I mean, none of the whole ludicrous plot of a very English scandal would have happened at all if the stigma against homosexuality hadn't been so pervasive. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, yes. Now, I wanted to pick you up on something you were just implying just there was yeah. really you've got a sneaking sympathy. It sounds as though you've got a sneaking sympathy for uh, Maxwell. And I think possibly this is a very common phenomenon. Of, very among common phenomenon, among, yes. Among biographers, I should yes. say. No, no, it is the great... Well, you feeling yeah. very complicit with your subject and you know them and you live with them. And is this the case with you? Or well, I, I, I completely you know? agree yeah. that it is, um, it is the great biographer's man trap. Um, I mean, uh, just to go back a bit, I mean, when I did A Very English Scandal, I didn't feel particularly sympathetic towards Jeremy Thorpe. Uh, although having spent quite a long time with Norman Scott, I pretty much ended up wanting to kill him as well. So I did feel quite sympathetic in that respect. With Maxwell, I didn't have any strong preconceived ideas about him. I mean, I would see him. I never worked for a Maxwell paper, and I did catch the very end of, of Fleet Street. And so, you know, Maxwell was an unavoidable presence. And, and it fascinated me that 
you know, there was a part of him that was like a figure out of an Italian comic opera. And there was another part of him that was like something out of a kind of Chicago gangster movie. And I was also fascinated by the way that he seemed to be simultaneously feared and ridiculed often by the same people. Um, and I, the more I explored Maxwell, yes, I did feel more sympathetic towards him than I'd expected. I mean, I'm not, I still think he was a monster, but I think that he was ultimately, in some respects, anyway, a tragic monster. Um Perhaps he became a monster. This is what I wondered as I was reading the book. You know, he had this absolutely terrible childhood. Yes. He had a good war, I think, you know, and won the military cross. Yeah. Um, up to the mid 50s, it's almost as though he could have gone either way. He could have been a good guy or a bad yeah, guy. Yeah, I think that's. I think, yes. Think I think you're right. Yes. I mean, you know, as, I mean, Maxwell lost three of his siblings both his parents and his grandfather in Auschwitz. And that's clearly the kind of prism you've got to see Maxwell's life through. You know, did it turn him into a monster? Well, you know, we obviously we can't say. Um, I think that it did unquestionably have a profound effect on him. But as you say, let us just say hypothetically, Maxwell, had died, say, in 1961, as opposed to 1991, he would be remembered in a very different way. He'd be remembered as a man who completely transformed uh, scientific publishing, and in doing so, actually paved the way for a number of very important discoveries in medicine and chemistry and physics and so on. And, and whilst it's very easy to say that Maxwell was solely interested in making money, um making money was always of paramount importance but nonetheless he did actually have a close interest in the scientific research that he was publishing and was greatly revered by the scientists whose work that he published um i mean of course it was a fantastic cash cow publishing scientific journalists, because all these academics had written these papers, were thrilled to see the stuff in print. And the, the last thing they, they expected was to be uh, paid for it. So he could sell these things all around the world. And of course, in the 50s, there was money being thrown at libraries um, to kind of, as it were, re-educate people after the war. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to see him as someone driven solely by expediency. Certainly at that stage, it's only really, as you say, that when we kind of get into the 1960s, that the picture all round darkens, personally and professionally. I think if I was a psychoanalyst, um, I would try and get him to talk about his relationship with his father. Yes. Very little is known about, but there's a horrible detail in your book about how his father made, rubbed, rubbed the little Robert's yan as he was form as his face in his own vomit and was yes very, very cruel and you know just a terrifying father figure i think but he was and, and of course maxwell himself became a terrifying father yeah. figure in time with kind of terrible inevitability so yes maxwell was was very frightened of his father um who <laughs> perhaps ironically, seems to be one of the very few law-abiding people in the village where he grew up. Um, and he adored and revered his mother, mm. who was probably the only person in his life who ever gave him unquestioning devotion, which, of course, is what he craved above all. Mm. Well, Betty did fairly well, I feel. She did that. to begin with, but uh, mm. you know, it was not unquestioning enough as, as the years went on. The other thing I find very, very fascinating, again, from a psycho, almost from a psychoanalytic view, is that business of him not buying Hedd Headington Hall. Yes, I was fascinated by that. I mean, he and, could afford it by a palace. Yes. If he'd want several palaces, if he'd wanted to, but he chose to rent. He always chose to rent, and it's very, and, and actually, I mean, it's not that unusual to find 
extremely rich people who aren't that interested in possessions. Um, and Maxwell certainly wasn't very interested in possessions. The, pretty much the only possession that he really treasured was his yacht, the Lady Ghislaine. Hmm. Um, I always found it, I also found it fascinating that he rented this, you know, big Italianate pile in Headington outside Oxford from Oxford Council, um, uh, where it now, again, another irony, houses the Oxford Brooks legal faculty. Um, um, and I wondered if there was some part of Maxwell that was instinctively loath to put down roots for fear that they might be torn up in the same way that that had happened to his, what well, to happen to him as a young man and of course to his parents. But in the same way, you'd think he'd want, you know, he wanted to put down roots. He was very, very keen, wasn't he, to be seen as British. He uh, was. Very reluctant to be seen as Jewish, you know, very reluctant to acknowledge his Jewishness. Well, that's certainly true, but he had a kind of, he had that sort of odd complaint, which I find is quite common in some aspects of British life, where you simultaneously want to sit at top table and kill everyone who's, everyone else who's sitting at top table. And Maxwell, part of Maxwell, yearned to join the establishment. Um, and the reason that he changed his name, I mean, he actually changed his name four times by the time he was 23, and he eventually plumped for Maxwell, <coughs> partly because it had, to his mind, a sort of pleasingly Scottish feel about him, not that he had any you know, Scottish connections at all. Um, and also, of course, that it had no Semitic connotations. And, you know, some of that was, you know, in many respects, you know, the, 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 it's such a kind of terrible, heretical thing to do amongst Jewish people in the wake of the war to deny one's Judaism. And Maxwell had no compunction about doing that whatsoever. Um, you know, when he became an MP in the mid 60s and he was phoned up by the Jewish Chronicle, he said, oh, you know, congratulations, great to have another Jewish MP. And Maxwell just barked, I'm not Jewish, down the phone and slammed it down. Um, and then in later life, he does re-embrace his Judaism. Um, I think, I think that there was a part of Maxwell that never fully believed in himself as anything, as a sort of cod Scottish gentleman, um, you know, as a sort of well, MP with this extraordinary plummy voice that he'd learned from uh, listening to speeches of Winston Churchill, gramophone records of Winston Churchill. Although when he started, he couldn't actually understand a word that Churchill was saying. Um, he'd reinvented himself to such a degree that he'd almost lost sight of his own foundations, I think. Yes, that's interesting. Um, do you think, so moving on a bit at this point, do you think he had any genuine interest in newspapers? I mean, for all their faults, I think Rupert Murdoch and Conrad Black are yes. very interested in, in newspapers. I feel with Maxwell, he wasn't really. It was just, it was all about power and money, mainly well, I, power. Yes, I mean, it's not, you know, it's no coincidence that Maxwell, having become an MP, um, and, you know, he was, he, he became a Labour MP, he claimed, uh, because uh, he couldn't, you know, possibly countenance betraying his working class roots. In fact, as he admitted to someone, he was, you know, he was a natural conservative, but he just feared again that the establishment was never going to have him. And there was you know, these ludicrous instances when he's campaigning to be MP for Buckingham, where he would get his chauffeur to drive his Rolls Royce down from London to the borders of the constituency. Then it would get exchanged the Rolls Royce for a beaten up old Rover, but with the chauffeur still in uniform with a cap, and then drive around the constituency while Maxwell loudly proclaimed his working class credentials. 
and uh, and he thought, I mean, he announced uh, before he became an MP that he fully intended being prime minister. And then when he got to the House of Commons, he had a kind of very rude shock that he wasn't, you know, there wasn't sort of fanfare of held trumpeters there to greet him. And he was actually treated as a joke, even by you know, his fellow Labour MPs. <laughs> Again, these stories of he would give speeches at the drop of a hat and his fellow Labour MPs would kind of tug on his jacket to try and get him to sit down after a bit. Maxwell can beat them off and carry on talking. And it's really only after he realises that his political career isn't going to go anywhere that he kind of takes a detour and decides that he's going to buy a newspaper instead. And this brings him up against the man who over really the course of almost 30 years turns into his arch nemesis who is Rupert Murdoch and as you say Murdoch had a political agenda um, and indeed you know to some extent Conrad Black did um, but Maxwell didn't really uh, I mean he made, made life absolutely impossible for Neil Kinnock who was the leader of the Labour Party at the time but not really because he was trying to kind of get him to pursue policies it was just a nightmare for Kinnick constantly trying to kind of appease this very mercurial man who could change his mind in a nanosecond but I do think that although he didn't have an agenda in that sense there was a part of Maxwell that absolutely loved the world of Fleet Street that kind of louche, rackety, rather sort of Damon Runyon-esque world uh, with, you know, people behaving extraordinarily badly and so on and so forth. He absolutely adored that and enjoyed the company of journalists. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he was a man who was ever really capable of friendship, but he certainly relished the company of journalists. He didn't um, have any interest in, as, as it were, the aesthetics of newspapers, did he? In he, didn't really have any, he didn't have any interest in the aesthetics of anything. No. Um, but no, I think that's true. Um, no, I think his only real interest in the aesthetics of newspapers was in plastering as many photographs of himself over the Daily Mirror as, as he could. Um, which, of course, you know, brought him yet more ridicule, um, which Maxwell was blithely unaware of. Um, but he was, you know, he did relish the power and the influence. And of course, when he bought the mirror in 1984, it meant that he and Rupert Murdoch were the two biggest power brokers in British political life. And the Tories knew perfectly well they couldn't get elected or re-elected without the support of the Sun. And, you know, the same was true uh, with the Mirror and the Labour Party. Um, and he certainly relished that and loved, he liked, you know, he liked the company of, of politicians as he liked the company of journalists. But, I, but again, without any real uh, agenda other than, I think, by that stage, self-advancement. Mm. Yes. Can I just tell you a little anecdote? Yes. About my encounter with uh, Robert Maxwell. He was quite often at the opera, places like Glyndebourne and Covent Garden, and he would invariably, if he saw me, come up to me shake me by the hand and say, ask me how I was. Now, I have no idea who he might have thought that I was, you know, because the only possible link is that my father had been editor of the Daily Mirror in the early 1980s, but it was absolutely petrifying to have this enormous great human being. You know, he did have certain charisma. Yes. Sending on one and, uh, you know, bestowing his charm in a funny way uh, on me. And I, I didn't know what to what to respond. And he would move on after he'd asked me how I was. And, 
sort of patted my hand, but I've never quite, never got to the bottom of it. Do you think this is typical of him? Well, I think I that think he, typical of him that he did have a sort of superficial charm that he Yes, I think, have. but I think that, you know, because if you look at, um, I mean, although they, they, they tend not to like to admit to it now, a lot of the people who worked for Maxwell at the Mirror and other, you know, um, newspapers in the group, quite liked him. Actually, they did quite like him. And, and indeed, if you look at how assiduously and brilliantly in many respects, he buttered up all those Eastern European dictators um, whose, you know, he would publish these insane hagiographies of them, his great leaders of the world series. I mean, I used to, you know, as I was researching the book, you know, roar myself to, to, to sleep with laughter, you're looking at these things. Um, and, and yet he, he was quite a charming man in some respects. But again, that's slightly faded over the years as, as the darkness starts to sort of encroach and swirl around. What do you think was the role of women in his life? I mean, he had these various girlfriends, but you don't yeah, feel that he... they got much out of it. And the relationship with Betty is fascinating. I think yeah. they did sort of stick it out. Well, and, yes, yeah, they, they did. For a divorce at the end, but yeah. it never comes to pass. And she's there, rushes to his side whenever there's a, a crisis. Yeah, the girlfriends all tended to be, you know, several, if not many epochs younger than Maxwell. Um, and the the marriage with Betty, to begin with, I mean, you read their love letters to one another and they... They were crazy about it. They absolutely adored uh, one another, tender, tender, passionate, romantic. And he was very, very handsome. When, I think that's... Very, something. very handsome. Very, very handsome. handsome. I mean, you know when he's working for British intelligence in the 1950s and he oh, goes yes. to Prague, there's a document in the Secret Service archives in Prague, which must have been done for the benefit of whoever had been detailed to tail Maxwell. And which basically says, you won't have any problem recognizing me. He looks exactly like Clark Gable. And he <laughs> did look like Clark Gable at the time. Then of course, you know, he, as, it, as the, Mail Online likes to put it, sported a fuller figure as the years went by. Um, and the relationship with Betty was fascinating. Um, I mean, I think that in the same way that you got to see uh, Maxwell's life through the prism of what happened to his parents, in the 1961, I think, um, the Maxwells had nine children, uh, and there was a daughter who died very young uh, in the late 50s. And then Michael, who was the, the oldest and the heir apparent, uh, when he was uh, about 17, was being driven back to Headington from a party, and the chauffeur-driven car collided with an unlit lorry. And Michael was sustained very bad head injuries and was in a coma for the next seven years before he died and, that, and indeed actually the same week that michael had his accident was the the week that Ghislaine, the youngest uh, child um was born and things the whole family dynamic starts to change at that stage and and the relationship with betty starts to break down as well. I mean, it was, you know, in the seven years that Michael was lying in a hospital bed about a mile away from Headington Hill Hall, Betty was under, uh, thought, was under the impression that Maxwell never went to see Michael in, in all those seven years. But in fact, that's not true, because I, I talked to the, his old chauffeur who said that quite often, he would drive Maxwell back down to Headington at night, late at night, and Maxwell would say, are you doing anything? And if the chauffeur said no, Maxwell said, let's go to the hospital. And they would go and Maxwell would sit by his son's bedside and he would talk to him, trying to elicit some glimmer of response. And yet he never told Betty, his wife, about that. 
why didn't he tell her? And I think probably because it hurt too much and he couldn't stand for her mm. by this stage to see his vulnerabilities. Mm. And she couldn't understand why he turned against her with such virulence. Um, and he would belittle her in public and really behave very unpleasantly. And she believed that when he re-embraced his Judaism, he somehow took it out on Betty for not being Jewish. Um, so are you amazed that she stuck it out for as long as she did? I think um, she felt yeah. that as the mother of nine children, seven of whom by this stage were still alive, it was her role to keep the family together and to keep as much a, a semblance of family unity mm. as was possible. And <clears throat> that was more important to her than the fact that she soaked up an increasing amount of punishment from her husband. And maybe that suited him too. I mean, when he goes on Desert Island Discs, doesn't he, he says, my, my, you know, thanks to my wife, Betty, you know, without whom, et cetera, et cetera. But he didn't really rely on her, did he? In no, because essentially by the point again, you know, it's, it's, although, you know, there has been, as it were, a progressive darkening of the picture from the 60s onwards, uh, the moment that the you know the really big black cloud settles overhead is in sort of 87 88 where the whole financial empire starts to fall apart and indeed as, as one of maxwell's uh daughters christine said to me you know our father definitely had megalomania by this stage and he really pushed everyone away and would sit up in his uh, apartment on the top of Maxwell House um, with no friends, uh, stuffing himself with Chinese takeaways and watching old Clint Eastwood movies. Yeah, yeah the, the, the eating, I think, is very, is very psychologically significant. Yeah, the I think that's true. Yeah. Into his mouth with his hands. Yes, I mean, it's like a, I did come to feel that the story of Maxwell is like a sort of terrible morality tale of someone for whom nothing was ever enough and that no amount of food, food sex yeah. booze power money whatever was going to fill this kind there was a sort of aching void at the heart of him and i don't think he had any understanding why it was there because he was someone who if he did ever uh feel any kind of twinge of introspection would try and stamp on it as, as soon as possible but i nonetheless do think it was there i don't i didn't feel from reading your book that actually either sex or booze were enormously important to him i didn't think well i think sex at once i mean i think he certainly did have flings um and he was drinking pretty heavily towards the end of his life um but yes i you know i i think you know what he really sought to begin with was the you know the aphrodisiac of power uh, yes. and and you know and money again was this quite a secondary issue in that respect i think yeah and what about his relationship with his children i mean the two of them who tragically yeah died very young kevin and ian joined him yeah and, um Business. Well, most of the children actually worked for him at one stage or another. Um, others did get, some of them did get away. As yeah, well. they did, yes, yeah, they did get away. I mean, um, Max, you, sorry, my one question, yeah, yeah, about, uh, sorry, one question about Ghislaine is, yes. why was she his, it's always said that she is his favourite, why was she his favourite? Well, I think partly because she was born in the same week that Michael had his accident. Her early years were totally overshadowed by this pall of grief. Um, and indeed, when she was, I think, three, Ghislaine goes to see her mother and stamps her foot and says, Mummy, I exist. Yeah. Um, and indeed, she was anorexic when she was 
I think four or five, I mean, really very young indeed. And then having taken very little notice of her, Maxwell and Betty drastically overcompensated by paying her as much attention as possible, as a result of which, as her mother said of her, she became terribly spoiled. But I think that she was, she was Maxwell's favorite. Um, she was the one who was better at charming him, at diffusing his rages. Um, and, you know, there would be these pretty grim Sunday lunches where each child would have to give a little speech about what they'd accomplished in that in the previous week and what they hoped to accomplish in the week to come. And then they'd be asked about current affairs. And another of his daughters described the kind of, you know, the terror of just sitting there. It's this sort of black searchlight of, Maxwell, as Ma of Maxwell's gaze passed around the table and got closer and closer. Um, and I think that Ghislaine wasn't as frightened actually mm. um but at, but nonetheless even she was pushed into not quite out of darkness by the end but something pretty near it do you think it, the maxwell family dynamic was it like succession where the children are constantly vying for their father's favor and where the father is constantly playing them off against each other no i don't think it it was like that because i don't i don't think maxwell actually had any interest in some respects he was too much of a narcissist to to want to even consider building a dynasty because i don't think he was really had any concern at all about what came after him that's interesting. Um, I mean, he didn't... Maybe because he knew that it was all smoke and mirrors, that in fact well, there was nothing... Yeah, I mean, it was, yes, but even... It certainly was smoke and mirrors towards the end, but it hadn't been smoke and mirrors for quite a long time. He didn't, he didn't have that relish of setting child against child in the way that Murdoch seems to have done um i mean as you say kevin and ian uh were the ones who worked most closely with their father um there's no suggestion at all that they uh were set against one another indeed they they you know have always been incredibly close and have actually worked uh together you know for the last 30 years since their father's death um so no, not in that sense. I mean, there was, but I do think, you know, there was as were a curdled family dynamic. Um, I just don't think it quite took that form. Yeah, uh, John, that's fantastic. We're we are, your time is up, and I'm now going to throw you to the lions. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> in the form of questions um, from members of the uh, biographers club. Thank you so much. That was such fun. No talking. pleasure. Thank you very much, Rupert. For the gripping conversation. I, I have one question for mm. you, John, which is, um, was it in the early 70s that Maxwell was declared not a fit and proper person to run a public company? Yes, it was actually, no, yes, it was, I think, 1971 that the DTI, as you say, said that he wasn't a, a fit person to run a public company. Did he bear grudges? That, Sorry, did he bear, that was did he bear my question. grudges? Oh, how, yes, very much. How did that rankle with him? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, actually, life? you know, what had happened was that he uh, was in 1969 going to sell Pergamon to an American man called Saul Steinberg, and, and Maxwell was going to go on the board of Steinberg's company, and it would be quite useful for Maxwell to open up these markets in America. And then Steinberg's accountants found that Maxwell had been falsely inflating his profits. So that's why the whole case was referred to the DTI. And, you know, Maxwell and Betty were, were really were cast into outer darkness. I mean, as, as Betty said, you know, the invitations dried up overnight. 
and Maxwell would be kind of shunned on the street. Um, and he worked like a dog and got the company back and bought back Pergamon for a fraction of what Steinberg had paid for it. And, this, and Steinberg had actually paid much less than Maxwell had, had, had asked because he'd been artificially inflating his profits. But within five years, he'd got the company back and had pretty much restored his reputation. I mean, he was then deemed to be, you know, okay by city bankers and, and you know, and a perfectly, as it were, valid risk. Uh, you talked about um, denying he was Jewish at one yeah. point. Some Jewish people certainly have the feeling, well, everything's okay at the moment, but, you know, the Nazis could come again. Yeah. Do you think that was uh, in the psychology of Maxwell, yes, as it yes. may well have been yes, given definitely. his family I, I, history? Yes, I, definitely, definitely, definitely. And he, he did quite a lot of business in Germany. Um, and, um, and, but would do kind of absurd things like, um, I remember speaking to one man who'd, uh, who'd been at a meeting uh, with Maxwell and a lot of German business people. And it was a very hot day. And Maxwell took off not only his shoes, but also his socks. And, uh, and apparently the, you know, the smell was absolutely overpowering these you know, enormous cheesy feet. And Maxwell plainly had done it to relish the discomfiture hmm. of you know, all these German people who were kind of ranged around this table. Uh, here's an interesting <laughs> question from Jane Winter. Do you think there are any parallels between Trump and Maxwell? Yes, definitely. Hmm. I think in terms of, you, I think you can plausibly argue that in terms of kind of crazed self-aggrandizement, Maxwell did kind of paved the way for Trump. I mean, you know, it's not a big leap to get from Maxwell House to Trump Tower. And indeed, Trump was quite in awe of Maxwell. Um, and Maxwell, in the beginning of 1991, buys the New York Daily News. I mean, he can't afford it, but nonetheless, he buys it. And and is treated like this kind of conquering hero as he steams into uh, New York, into Manhattan aboard the Lady Ghislaine. And Trump had tried to buy the New York Daily News repeatedly throughout the 1980s as a springboard to launch his political career, but had failed to do so, partly because he didn't have enough money at the time. So, yes, I think that um, <laughs> Maxwell's valet told me a story about Trump coming onto a coming to a party on board the Lady Ghislaine, and Maxwell would insist that all the guests took off. Again, would take no, they didn't. I can't remember if they took off their shoes or they had to cover their shoes with these kind of blue plastic booties, which Trump did very reluctantly. Um, and the butler said he just remembers Trump looking around with this expression of complete sort of awe on his face as he you know, gazed at the soft furnishings and all the rest of it. So yes, you know, long answer, but I think there is unquestionably a big, you know, parallel between the two of them. Jan Slimming asks whether you interviewed Maxwell's sister, Sylvia Rosen. No, I think she had died by this time that I started work on the book. I interviewed three of Maxwell's uh, children Ian, most of all, and Christine and Isabel, who are twin sisters. Um, and that was it from the family. The other children uh, didn't want to participate. I mean, actually, oddly enough, I thought at one stage, Ghislaine might have been about to talk, but then we were rather overtaken by events. Uh it was Sarah Anderson, my <coughs> colleague at the Biographers Club, asked about whether you spoke to Ghislaine. Paul Smitty asked whether, whether you attempted to do a biography of Ghislaine. No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I mean, I am supposed to be covering her trial, 
uh, right. which has just been put off until uh, November at the earliest. Um, but uh, no, I don't think I could really face doing a biography of Ghislaine. Although actually, and I know this is a very unfashionable thing to say, um, I do think she's been treated appallingly, actually. I mean, whatever she may or may not have done, she deserves a fair trial. And you know, she's unlikely to get one and has been kept in what seemed to me extraordinarily punitive conditions. But anyway, that's possibly neither here nor there. Richard Brooks and Moira Taylor both ask about Maxwell's death. Yes. Richard says, uh, have you any more thoughts about whether Maxwell took his own life or had a heart attack? He says, you slightly fudge it in your very readable book. <laughs> but uh, uh, speaking to the biographers club and writing a book are different things. No, I mean, I don't actually have, you know, I sadly, you know, there's no uh, smoking gun that I've managed to unearth subsequently that, um, you know, I, I'm in possession of. Um, I, you know, I vacillated and continue to vacillate between suicide and an accident. Um, and I'm probably more inclined to say suicide now. Uh, but, you know, the next time the wind changes direction, I, you know, I might go with it, I think. Right. So again, I know that's not a satisfactory answer, but that's about as good as I can do. Yeah, are you ruling out the Israeli Secret Service? Though? Well, I mean, and what I can't, to me, is there's absolutely no evidence that Maxwell was murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there was plausible evidence, I would be perfectly happy to consider it. But it just doesn't make sense um, that you go to the trouble and expense of uh, sending a team of amphibious hitmen out into the, <laughs> the Atlantic to inject Maxwell with some lethal poison and tip him into the water. When you know he was so addicted to self publicity, he was virtually walking around with a target pinned to his forehead. So it would be dead easy to assassinate him far more cheaply on dry land. <laughs> Here is a, just a, um, an anecdote from Heather Wardell. Uh, when I worked on the European newspaper, she says, uh, Israeli spies photographed some of us at our homes, and all sorts of strange things happened in the offices. Oh, well, that yeah. is very interesting. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, there's no doubt that Maxwell did have close connections with Mossad. And of course, he had very close connections in Russia. Um, and, the, you know, the, and, and Maxwell was a spy for British intelligence in the 50s, no question about that. Um, but my feeling was that he probably stopped being a spy, as it were, a full-time spy for anyone at the end of the 50s. But he cons what he loved most of all was being a conduit for information because it appealed to his vanity. And so he would, and he was very, he was very useful in that respect um, to the British and, to, and, and to, indeed to the Russians and to the Israelis because there were very, very few people with his contacts book. Um, but I do think there's a big difference between uh, his being, as it were, a kind of purveyor of high class tittle tattle and being a spy. Lisa Creamy, I forgive me if I mispronounce your surname, Lisa. Um, can you draw any comparison between Basil Brown, Thorpe and Maxwell? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, well, um, I think I might have to go and shut myself away in a cave for a long time to actually, I mean, I can sort of see parallels between Thorpe and Maxwell. You could just about argue that, um, you know, they both led, 
secret lives um and obviously they had you know they were both politicians um uh well I, and I suppose you could say that Basil Brown was thwarted by the British establishment to some degree or the archaeological establishment and Maxwell too was thwarted by the uh, British establishment um but I can sort of hear the elastic fraying <laughs> as I say it <laughs> David Love asks were your primary sources mainly personal interviews or did Maxwell leave any trail of private correspondence or even journals uh, uh, no, to some he, of the family gave access no he left no journals at all because you know i said uh, that you know the idea that maxwell would keep a journal was just completely sort of antithetical to him because um he just didn't work like that and his own thought processes were of no particular interest to him i think um i, I did talk to a lot of people um on all kind of you know strata as it were you know i, I to my astonishment rupert murdoch agreed to see me um and then uh you know in some respects it was equally valuable to be able to talk to his valet and his chauffeur and his cook and all those sorts of things um there was the letters the love letters are still around and indeed betty maxwell wrote an extremely interesting and frank book about five years after maxwell died pointedly called a life of my own about what it was like being married to maxwell and and, and the, de the sort of decline and unraveling of their marriage um but other than that um no but one of the great advantages of maxwell as a subject was that he was himself a compulsive mythomaniac so he would always you know whenever he told a story about himself he would kind of slap on an extra layer of varnish which he didn't really need to do because the stories were quite good enough in their own right and then everybody who had anything to do with Maxwell has Maxwell stories. Some of them indeed wrote whole books about Maxwell. And what's fascinating is that some of the stories turn out to inevitably to be completely apocryphal, but it doesn't really matter because they still tell you a lot about how Maxwell was perceived that people would think that these invariably quite outlandish things were plausible. We're coming to the end of our time, John. May I ask you one question about the dig and one question about a very English? Yes, standard. of course. Uh, uh, Nicolette Jones asks, how much of the story of the dig did you get from your aunt? Well, the, weirdly, the short answer to that is none, because my mm -hmm. aunt, there was due to very complicated family dynamics, my aunt and my father didn't really talk. So I didn't really know my aunt. And it was only... Uh, after she died that I found out about Sutton Who. She did leave my half sister a sort of a journal, which weirdly has nothing about Sutton Who in it, but nonetheless gives you, you know, an interesting flavor and, you know, tone of voice and things like that. Um, so it wasn't as if this was kind of, family legend at all. I mean, my father probably never knew that my aunt had found the first gold at Sutton Hoo, and if he did know, wouldn't have been remotely interested. <laughs> and uh, in a very English scandal, when you saw Hugh Grant and um, Ben Wishaw's performances, did you think they're great performances? Did you think, or they've nailed it? But, uh, when, uh, well, the weird thing about Varying Scandal was that it all happened very quickly because very soon after the book came out, the rights got bought. And then there seemed to only be about kind of two week gap. And then someone phoned me up and said, oh, you know, Russell T. Davis is adapting it. And then there was another two weeks went by and Stephen Frears is directing it. Another two weeks went by. Mm -hmm. And oh, Hugh Grant is going to play Jeremy Thorpe, at which point I thought privately that is one of the most ludicrous pieces of miscasting I've ever come across. 
but it doesn't matter because he's famous. So at least, you know, he'll get some attention. And then I, the first time I went on set and I saw him in full makeup with that kind of weird comb over that Thorpe had and wearing one of the double breasted waistcoats that Thorpe had, it didn't look like to wear. It was really uncanny, actually. I did feel that kind of Thorpe had been reincarnated in front of me. And I thought that he was absolutely brilliant as Thorpe really brilliant as thought um and 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 I, and I and again i thought uh ben wishaw was terribly good as norman scott norman scott typically didn't think ben wishaw was very good at all but <laughs> thought it was too fay um which yeah possibly true um but and also he got very angry about uh what he called Ben's incorrect carriage on a horse. <laughs> he was holding the reins the wrong way, I think, or something like this. Um, but, you know, Norman is not a man who's easily satisfied. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. I'm just going to pass now, if I'll ask her to unmute herself, to our chair, Jane Ridley. Thank you. Uh, John and Rupert, thank you so much. It was incredibly entertaining and enjoyable and fascinating talk. Um, one reviewer of The Fool uh, wrote that this book slips down like beluga caviar. And I think that um, your, both of your, Rupert's incredibly good questions and John's wonderful answers have proved that that is exactly right. Thank you so much. It's been a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rupert. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Nicholas. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.